We have a very good relationship with the London office of the Philippines Department of Tourism. And this year, we agreed to travel around the country to film as many of the main tourist attractions as possible, to produce movies which can be shown at exhibitions and conferences and on their website, for example. Siobhan has been to these places before, but as I hadn't, I was very willing to agree to the project. I was really keen on visiting to Sagada. For one thing, I'd heard so many positive things about the place, but also I could catch up with my good friends, Wolfie and Wang, who I hadn't seen since they moved to Sagada about four years ago. We had just arrived from filming the rice terraces in Banawi and were completely terraced out. So having to film this imagined cave was a pleasant change. I'd never filmed a cave before, so it did feel like the blind leading the blind when I had to direct people around for lighting positions. My four video lights, along with the guide's tilly lamps, worked reasonably well, but I'd love to do it all over again with proper lighting. It was great fun filming and even better so because we were given first class service by the local tourism office. But I had to disagree with them on one thing. They call this rock formation the horse. I say it looks more like a lion. What do you think? Boracay. Almost every Filipino's dream holiday destination. The diving around Boracay hasn't got the best of reputations, so I've always dismissed going there. After all, it's just a beach, right? Filming for the DOT, we were given the opportunity to go there and have a look for myself. And I must admit, I was wrong about being dismissive. Yes, there's a big beach, there's lots of people, and it's relatively expensive, but it's like nothing else in the Philippines. It has energy and personality. When we told our good friend Yvette Lee where we were going and where we were going to stay, she told us, no, 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 you can't stay there. Leave it with me. So off she went and pulled a few strings. Soon she came back and told us, right, you're staying at Discovery Shores. You'll like it there. And like it we did. A lot. Part of the deal in staying there included doing a bit of filming for Discovery Shores which although turned out to be quite a lot of work, we got to see the whole place and meet and got to know the management team. Leeds and his staff were superb and helped us so much in organising our other filming activities. It's a fantastic resort, but the one thing that we liked the most was our room. It was the size of some people's apartment. The bed was probably the most comfortable I've ever slept in and there was everything you could possibly need with only one point being dropped and that was by not having PG tips with the courtesy tea and coffee. Service is second to none, and we even got a welcome foot scrub. But for me, the one thing I will remember for a long time to come was on May the 12th. Siobhan and I had a superb candlelit dinner on the beach at Indigo's. The stars were out, the most romantic setting, good food, good wine, with my beautiful girlfriend. It was my birthday, and I had a great day. We may not have experienced the famous Boracay sunset in all its glory, but there's always another time. Maybe next year. On to another filming adventure on behalf of the DOT takes us to Lake Taal in Luzon. Lake Taal used to be connected to the sea, but following some major eruptions in the 18th century, the narrow gap was reduced to just a draining river. Rainfall over the last couple hundred years has diluted the salty seawater, so now it's just fresh water. Apparently, bull sharks used to live in the lake until the last one was killed off in the 1930s. We were here for a couple of days to capture the beautiful scenery, but no visit to Lake Taal is complete until you've made it to the Crater Lake on Volcano Island. To get to the island takes about 20 minutes on board one of these uniquely designed bank boats. It was a particularly hot day and even the local dogs were trying to keep cool. There are two ways of getting up to the Volcano Lake. Walking, which to be honest, when it's 35 plus degrees, dry and dusty will take you to two to three hours and you're only wearing chinellas it doesn't sound very appealing or ride a horse which in my books is only a slight improvement on walking horse riding is not my thing against my better judgment 
we take a horse each and 45 minutes later we're at the top. The views are breathtaking and as my anatomy sorts itself out and drops back into their correct positions I start work filming. Another fact for you, this lake is the largest lake in the world that is a lake that's on an island that is in a lake that's on an island. Got that? If not, look it up on Wikipedia. It's scorching hot up here as the rocks are hot too. Not surprising really as it's a volcano. But soon our work is done and it's time to head down. Here is my trusty steed. But why do I feel so guilty about getting on such a small horse? In my mind though, I know the horse will have the last laugh. Back at the bottom and Siobhan's got a big smile on her face as she loved every minute. For me, I'm just glad it's all over. Beer o'clock has come along and it's time to sit back and enjoy one of Josephine's finest and coldest SMBs. Back to Sagada in the mountain province. We like Sagada a lot. The people, the climate, the scenery, it's one of our favourite parts of the Philippines. It's a bit of a myth that Banawi is the only place to go for rice terraces. It's not true, as the terracing is all over the mountain and Ifugaran provinces. Sagada has some very beautiful terracing, and you have it all to yourself. We were doing time lapse one afternoon, looking down at the Kilti Pan rice terraces. It's a spellbinding place, different from Banawi because of the stone walling and slightly wild and overgrown feeling. It felt more natural. I wanted to do more time lapse and wanted to go to the tiny village of Baang, here. So on our very last day, we trekked for about an hour to get to Baang. This is where we were a few days before. Sadly, the weather wasn't being considerate to our love of the place and these dark, dark clouds were coming our way. I know, I said. These clouds will just give us a little sprinkle and dry up in no time. Let's have a cup of tea and wait. The tea was duly made, and after a few more minutes, it started to rain. And rain, and rain. These were the only shots we managed to take before we got completely drenched. Stood there, ankle deep in water, bin bag over the camera, umbrellas up, but at least I had my tea. Things have certainly changed in 12 months since the last time we dived Monad Shoal in Malapascua. The dive shops have discovered new places on the shoal where the sharks are coming to for a clean in the morning. It's apparently not uncommon to see 10 sharks on a dive. Today's date, the 14th of June, has become in my diary, Thrasher Shark Day. On this date, two years ago, I met the former president of the Philippines, Gloria Royo, underwater on Pescador Island, Mobile, whilst watching the Thrasher Sharks hunt on the school of sardines. There was no hunting today, but we saw five different sharks come in for a clean. The thresher shark is one of the most beautiful and elegant of sharks, and we are privileged to be able to see them on a daily basis at Monad Shoal. This doesn't happen anywhere else in the world. We were really encouraged last year to see some common sense being employed at long last in Malapascua by the dive shops agreeing to no-go areas for divers in the traditional viewing areas of Shark and Manta Point. This would allow coral regeneration and cleaner fish populations to grow and give the thresher sharks reason to return every day for cleaning. But since new cleaning stations have been found, that common sense seems to have been forgotten by all but the odd dive shop. Divers are meant to be the guardians of the oceans, but I see little or no evidence of this each time I dive Monad Shoal. I fear that within a short period of time, the newly found cleaning stations will be trashed just like the old ones. Will a dive master in Malapascua please explain to me how telling your customers to sit on the reef benefits anyone else but you for maybe getting a bigger tip? Will a visiting diver to Malapascua please explain to me where in your dive training it says it's okay to trash a reef? Also. Where does it say in the standard safe diving practices statement you sign at every dive shop that you go to that it's okay not to maintain proper buoyancy as you were diving Monad Shoal? If you can't dive like this, stay away until you can. 
and give the reefs and sharks a chance. I've been lucky enough to have dived almost all over the Philippines. But if you know what Verde Island is, then you could be surprised to know it's only this year that I've managed to dive it and experience its, how can I put it, majesty, grandeur, splendidness. I've made four dives here now and each and every one of them I've had to surface because I'd run out of air. This isn't because I'm being a muppet or dangerous, I knew I was going to run out of air. It's because I just didn't want to come up. It's that good a dive site. Currents can be extremely challenging, even for experienced divers. From talking to my mates, I know I've had it easy so far. But even so, I've nearly had my mask taken off my face when peeking around a rock in a current. What Verdi lacks in megafauna, it certainly makes up for it in fish numbers. Personally, I have never seen so many Antheas and Fusiliers on one dive site, and I'd go so far to say that this is the most fish you will see on a reef anywhere in the Philippines, and that includes Tubataha. I know my filming here doesn't actually back up that story, but if you don't believe me, go and take a look for yourself. Along with Black Rock and Del San Rec, Shark Airport offers the best diving in Tubataha. Beautiful reefs, big schools of Big Eye Trevelli and Chevron Barracuda, the opportunity to go deep down the near vertical wall, it has it all. And normally, mantas come in for cleaning on the top of the reef. Last year, I had the most amazing dives with three manta coming in to be cleaned. They came so close to me that one of them actually touched my camera with her wingtip. But this year, their behaviour is different. They don't seem to want to come to the reef top, and instead just cruise along the wall. It's just conjecture, but maybe they've just got fed up of divers invading their cleaning stations. We had been so looking forward to seeing the mantas up close, that, to be honest, we were all feeling a little deflated. Even the big eye Trevelli didn't want to come and play. And Bannerfish nibbling on a fan is cute, but sorry, there are no substitute for a three metre wide manta looking you square in the eye. And then, in an instant, it all changed. We had made our way heading towards washing machine when this little fella decided to come and say hello. The current by now had really picked up and it was hard work just to stay still. But that didn't bother the manta, as he effortlessly stayed in one place. It was time for us to say our farewells and start going up a bit, when hold on, there's two more manta coming towards us. These two were a fair bit bigger than the first one, and a little bit more confident to come closer to us. As one decides to move on away from us, so the second follows. And now it's definitely time for us to go up, as our deco time is building. As we ascend to the rooftop, hold on, there's another one! Having a closer look, I recognise the markings on this one's belly, and I'm pretty sure I filmed her last year. So there we have it, concrete proof. Four manta in the space of 15 minutes makes them officially more common than London buses. If you'd like to see more of our videos, please feel free to subscribe to us on YouTube or like us on Facebook.